Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. Welcome this morning to our penultimate Ted's Chapel. Uh, one more meeting next week. Uh, we're glad to be back after our Easter break uh, and to hear again um, from a brother in Christ uh, who is still a Christian and to, to hear more of, of, that, of that story and of what uh, Christ has done and what he means for us. We welcome you here, uh, coming in out of the cold today. And for those of you who are online, thank you for joining us there. Um, I have a, we have a brief announcement from the uh, undergraduate ministry called MUG, Men Under God. Uh, I invite Parker to come up and say a word about that. It, it, it relates to the men in the seminary. Hey, everyone. It's great to see you guys. It's great to be here at Ted's Chapel, too. Uh, my name is Parker Lundberg. I'm in the five-year BAM Div program here at Trinity, also an RA on campus, and vice president of MUG, or Men Under God, next year. Just wanted to give a quick announcement about MUG, but before I do that, just share a quick story. Um, I was an intern at Anago Community Church in Wisconsin, and the youth pastor that I was under he was a mechanic for many years, and actually uh, a mechanic in the Army, too. And he had, at some point in time, he had to go through schooling. He was going through schooling for whatever mechanics go to school for. I don't know. I'm here for TEDs, so I'm not 100% certain. But he was going through mechanic school, and he learned a lot. He learned a lot of stuff about auto mechanics and stuff like that. And then eventually, afterwards, he got a job, and he had to apply that information that he, that he learned. And he was working on a car, he was, he was remembering all the information that he had learned, but he couldn't put it into practice. He's like, I actually don't know what I'm doing. And so with that in mind, my question to all the men in the room, at least for this men's ministry, Men Under God, is if we are attending an evangelical school to learn how to teach the scriptures, to disciple and to evangelize well, but we don't do that in our current setting while we're still here, how do we expect that to transition once we're sent out? So that's my question to the men in this room that maybe are interested in this ministry. And a couple of things that I want to highlight about MUG is we are a discipleship-based uh, fellowship group of men centered around biblical community. And our meetings are weekly, about one hour. One hour a week, we have three different meeting times that you can attend and that we would invite you to attend. Tuesday at 7 p.m. in Lower Waybright, so one of the meeting rooms downstairs in Lower Waybright. Uh, Wednesday, which is actually my group, at 8 p.m., uh, Madsen, Madsen Hall, room 407, excuse me, 408, and then Thursday night, 8 p.m., also in Madsen. So we would like to invite the graduate students to kind of get involved over the next couple weeks that we have. I know it's going to be probably a squeeze with finals coming up and stuff like that, but we want to invite you men to get involved. Uh, a vision that we, the undergraduates of MUG, have is to bridge that gap between the men over in the seminary and the men in undergraduate Trinity College. <clears throat> Some of the events that we're looking to do next year is a men's conference in the spring. Uh, continue those small group events, even though they might look a little different next year. We have a lot of uh, different leadership turning over and coming in. And we have a desire, again, like I said, to bring Ted's into that, to be a part of that. Uh, so if you're interested, come check it out. I mean, there's a flyer. It should be, yep, up there. My email is up there. I mean, you can probably type in Parker Lundberg and it should come up. Uh, if that's a little difficult for you, a very easy email to get in contact with is mug, M-U-G at T-I-U dot E-D-U. Very simple, very easy. Um, so yeah, check us out if that interests you, if you feel called, if you feel like you want to invest in the men that are here on Trinity's campus, if that's something that interests you, please get in contact with us. We'd love to hear from you. So looking forward to it. Blow up that email inbox, all right? And uh, thanks for letting me speak. Appreciate it, guys. 
in our chapel time today. Uh, we'll be led in worship by um, David Engstrom, who will read scripture, um, uh, Dr. Lucas O'Neill, who um, is subbing today. Uh, we, we moved to our homiletics professor when we learned on Friday that our guest speaker um, has come down with COVID and uh, was not able to be here. So uh, thank you, Lucas, for, for being here in his place. And then musically, we'll be led by Ryan McConnell. And we look forward to this time of just gathering together. We stand with me, please, and we will um, we'll speak together these words from Psalm 105 as our call to worship. You'll read the part in yellow. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength, seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. You, his servants, the descendants of Abraham, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. Let us look to him in song and in prayer and in word today. Well, good morning, good morning, everyone. Um, I am going to introduce our time of worship a little bit further, and I'm actually gonna just invite you to sit down. Um, this morning, we're going to uh, embark on a time of, of prayer, meditation, and worship together. And um, this weekend I had the opportunity to go to a retreat where we talked about lament. And uh, in this time, it really struck me of how the Psalms guide us to uh, hold lament and praise together at the same time. And so this morning we're gonna do a more contemplative form of worship. And for those of you that this might be new or unusual or maybe just not your favorite thing, uh, I invite you to try it anyway. Um, there will be points in our worship time together in which you can sing uh, if you'd like to sing. There will be points of silence if you would like to just pray and hold that space of silence. There will be points of time where there's just music and no words and in which I just invite you to use this time how God is leading you. If you'd like to stand at the points in time in which we're singing, I invite you to do that. If you'd like to remain seated, you can also do that. Um, my ultimate hope for us this morning is that as we are coming together uh, in this place that we can just sit in this holy space, sit in this space together in laments and in praise, both individually and as a community. Uh, so we'll start with a moment of silence to begin our time of contemplative worship and followed by music, then singing.
Jesus be the center of it all. Jesus be the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Well, nothing else matters. Well, nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center. Well, everything revolves around you. Jesus, you. Jesus, be the center of my life. Jesus, be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, well, nothing else matters. Well, nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center. Well, everything revolves around you. Jesus, you. Jesus, be the center of your church. Jesus, be the center of your church. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, but nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Well, Jesus, you're the center. Well, everything revolves around you. Jesus, you. Sing, come, Lord Jesus, come. We sing, come, Lord Jesus, come. We sing, come, Lord Jesus, come. We sing, come, Lord Jesus, come. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, just come to the fountain. And if your heart in the stream of life, the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out to deep we sing holy spirit come holy Yeah. 
down to the fountain Dip your heart in the stream of life The pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of his mercy As deep cries out to deep We sing come Lord Jesus come Come Lord Jesus come Come Lord Jesus come Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and I'll come back and receive you unto myself. Let's go to him in prayer. The time of prayer in the Easter season, these verses were written by the poet and hymn writer Charles Wesley, reflecting on Job 19, verse 25. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. We'll use these verses. I will read the verse. We'll have a time of silence. The words will stay on the screen as a point of reflection for your own personal engagement with these promises, these truths, uh, these um, reflections on what it means that we have a Redeemer who lives. So let's pray. I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me, a token of his love he gives, a pledge of liberty. Find him lifting up my head. He brings salvation near. His presence makes me free indeed, and he will soon appear. He wills that I should wholly be. Who can withstand his will? The counsel of his grace in me he surely will fulfill. Jesus, I hang upon your word. I steadfastly believe you will return and claim me, Lord, and receive me to yourself. Lord Jesus, our Redeemer, we have confidence that you live, and we've heard the testimonies throughout this semester of your persevering, your persistent grace extended to your children. We know that you live, we know that you always live to intercede for us. And we know as well that you will again stand upon the earth and prepare us for that meeting with you. 
Lord, we pray in hope. We pray with thanksgiving. And we pray in joy. In your own name, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Again, that's Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than that, we would rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. morning, uh, Trinity. I want to uh, take a few moments now to look at this wonderful passage in Romans chapter 5. Now, when talking about um, the question, why I'm still a Christian, uh, there's some different ways we can go about answering that question. I can stand here and talk to you about uh, my mother and how she is the gave me the first explanation of the gospel and faithfully took me to church. I can talk about church and the church community and how that has kept me along the way. The different pastors that have spoken into my life have played a major role in both the inception and the, the keeping of the faith um, that I have. I can talk about my wife. I can talk about my kids, my congregation, many of you. Uh, I often tell people I am as ministered to by the student body and the faculty as I more so probably than, than I minister to anyone here. But I think, I think that gets more to the means, right? Like how I'm kept, but not, not why. And I think why is a deeper question. It's a deeper question. And to get to that question, I think this passage is helpful. And the reason why the question is so pertinent is because of the heartache, the heartbreak that we experience when people that we trusted, people that have ministered to us, people with tremendous skill and gifting in ministry, walk away. Family members, you walk away. People in ministry that you poured into, and you're like, this this brother's gonna end up teaching Sunday school. This sister's gonna lead some, some of our small groups. And they seem so promising. They say all the right things and their theology is in line. And then they, I don't know where to walk away. Your favorite author, your favorite worship leader, some YouTube personalities that you go to for hopefully not your only source of sustenance. That should be your local church, of course. But we do appreciate, don't we, of various ministries across the globe by people who put their uh, literature out there or their blogs and, and then... We were encouraged by them, our faith was built up by them, and then they walk away. That hurts. Why am I still Christian? I I don't want to waste your time with my anecdotes and stories because I 
I think they're really beside the point. I think if we remain a Christian so long as there are certain realities in our lives, we're just waiting for the one situation that just takes faith out. It's got to be something deeper than what you are currently experiencing or how you feel about Christianity, how you currently feel about what you're experiencing in life. So I hope you turn there with me, Romans chapter 5. And um, I did get to select my own text, and I'm walking in here like, why did I choose 11 verses from uh, such a dense passage like this? Well, we won't cover everything, obviously, but some things I want to highlight. And the first thing is that I think we need to understand salvation in its three phases. This is old hat for many of you, hopefully all of you, but uh, the work of God in, uh, in, in salvation in terms of what he has accomplished is accomplishing and will accomplish. Check it out there in the first two verses. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have been justified by faith, and because of that reality, we have peace with God now through our Lord Jesus Christ, and through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Why am I still standing as a Christian? Grace. And then that allows us to rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So we need to understand that this entire scope of salvation, if I'm asking myself, why am I still a Christian? It has everything to do with how it started and where it's going. And without an understanding of where it's going, this won't endure. Without a clear picture of the destination, this won't last. If we're trying to trek the wilderness and we're not clinging to the land of promise, when this gets difficult and we feel like we're starving, we're just going to miss Egypt. And so it's this whole picture that Paul puts in front of us, not just backwards looking at justification, but looking forward to glorification, the very glory of God that we hope in. Now, with that in mind, with those sort of three phases that might call it, I think where Paul goes next is to help us understand that without understanding that third phase, this is flimsy, this won't work, this won't last. And I think that's because when we see defectors, people who walk away from the faith, they don't have this hope, they don't cling to it, it's not sure, and so this is not sure. If that's not a reality, this really isn't a reality for me. Look at verse 3. He says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I never heard of these guys until they defected from the faith, but Rhett and Link apparently were some really super famous YouTube personalities. I never heard of them until friends and family members started complaining and they were heartbroken. Rhett and Link, I, I don't know, I've still yet to watch an episode or whatever, but in their podcast or YouTube channel, whatever, wherever they express this, one of them said, you know what, I'm going to call myself a hopeful agnostic. And then the other one, I think, Link said, well, I, I'm going to call myself an agnostic that hopes I can have hope. <laughs> I mean, literally, I'm someone who doesn't know or can't know, and therefore I hope. But Paul says, it's because I know that I hope. And so I, when you look at that, you say, okay, yes, if you don't know, then your hope, your version of hope is flimsy. I'm an agnostic, 
but I'm a hopeful of not. I hope there's something, but I don't think there's something. I'm not sure if there's something. It'd be nice if there's something, but I don't know. Well, it's no wonder someone like that walks away. But when Paul says hope, he's not speaking of hope in that way. It's different. It's because we've been justified and we know we have this peace with God that our hope is an enduring kind of hope. Why? Because he doesn't paint a rosy picture. Verse 3, we rejoice as long as there is no suffering. We rejoice until there's suffering. Yeah, that's what defectors do. But we rejoice even in the actual sufferings. We rejoice in our sufferings. Now, he's not just saying, I rejoice. He's bringing the Roman Christians, both Jews and Gentiles, into this picture. If we've been justified and we have peace with God, we rejoice even when sufferings hit because of that future picture. We know that suffering produces endurance. What's endurance good for? Character. And what's character good for? Producing hope. And that hope doesn't put us to shame. If my hope is not future looking and all I have is just what's in front of me now, I will follow God as long as this picture in front of me makes sense. Then when suffering hits, I'm put to shame. Because when my friends, my neighbors, my spouse, my kids say, what kind of God is that that you're serving? That he would allow that disease, that he would allow that job loss, that he would allow that difficulty. And I'm like, yeah, I feel shamed. I feel like my hope has been put to shame because of this suffering. That's a different kind of hope than what Paul is talking about. Paul's kind of hope is emboldened and strengthened, underscored and highlighted by the suffering itself. It's not incongruous. The suffering just deepens our hope for the future. We know this is just the wilderness, and yes, this is tough, but glory is ahead. That's an unrobbable hope, brothers and sisters. Why am I still a Christian? Because this wilderness is temporary. And I don't expect this to be paradise. I don't expect this to be glory. And when the things hit that are difficult by God's grace, the grace in which I stand, I cling to this future hope that is sure. How do I know it's sure? It's not evidences. It's not apologetics. I mean, people clamored for signs. Give us signs. Give us signs. Well, I gave you some signs. No, give me more signs. You know what? I'm not giving you a sign. A wicked generation asked for a sign. Well, how do we know? Look at verse 5. The hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, that love has content. It's not just a feeling. It's not like I just wake up in the morning, and even though things are going badly around me, I just close my eyes and I hear the chirping birds of God's love kind of resonating in my heart, you know, in my soul. That, that's, that could be a part of it. I don't, I don't want to downplay emotion and feeling, but that goes up and down. We need a constant. And so he's going to talk about the content of that love as he moves forward after explaining that, hey, we need to understand this third phase of salvation, so to speak. Our aim, our target is that that final destination of God's glory. And when we do that, we will endure. But part of that endurance and part of that aiming for the future and that hope is understanding God's love that's poured into our hearts. So he explains it, verses 6 and following. For while we were still weak, at the right time, God, or at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love, picking up from God's love poured into our hearts in verse 5. How does God demonstrate that love, show that love, prove it? He shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So when he lays out the explanation of God's love, it's not just a feeling, it's understanding the very heart of the gospel. That just at the right time, 
perhaps he means eschatologically before God's wrath was poured out, but maybe he just means at that time where we were too weak to do anything about it, God stepped in with the work of Jesus Christ. While we were still weak, at that right time, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were still weak. I, I need to pause and just unpack this a little bit briefly I, because I think this is something we skip over way too easily. I don't think Paul means we're weak, like we're kind of good, we just need a little bit of a boost. We're halfway up the ladder, we just need help with that final rung. Weak could be, you know, general sickness, a general ailment. Here, Timothy, you take some wine, you have a little bit of your weakness there. But oftentimes, weak, asthenes, is used of being at death's door. Like Epaphroditus was asthenes in Philippians 2. To the point of death. 2 Timothy 4, uh, Troph Trophimus was left behind in Miletus, you remember that? And it's because he was asthenes. He could not travel with Paul anymore. It's not a sniffle or a cold. It's an inability to do what you're supposed to do. In 2 Corinthians 11, you remember when Paul says, y'all pushing each other out of the way to fill yourself up on communion at the Lord's Supper. Don't you have food at home? You're eating and drinking judgment on yourselves, and that's why many of you are asthenes, and some of you have even died from the asthenes. I don't think what Paul is saying here is you're kind of weak, right? You are weak to the point of death before you're made alive with God. In fact, you are dead. And then look at the words he uses to emphasize it. Why we were still weak? Christ died for the ungodly. Here's what you're not. You're not righteous. Verse 7, I'm not righteous. I'm not a good person. That's the contrast. Now, somebody might die for a good person. What's Paul saying? That ain't us. It's the fact that we didn't deserve it that it proves God's love. He calls it sin. In verse 8, he shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners. So verse 6, while we were still weak, just to be clear, it's our sinfulness. And it's the fact that we rightly deserve, just to push ahead a little bit, the end of verse 9, the wrath of God. I don't know if I deserve wrath. Here's a final one, verse 10. Why we were enemies. Here's how we think of the Christian life. I was bumping along and I just was weak in the sense that I, didn't, I wasn't fulfilled. I didn't have answers. I felt lost. I had habits and addictions. I needed to kick those. So I came to Jesus so he can help me out of my weakness. You're not, you've left Paul's Line of thought. What Paul means was by weak was enmity with God. That's why he started with the concept of peace with God in verse 1. Now, it's hard for us to see that sometimes. Well, I'm not, I know there are enemies of God. There are people that hate God. They spew hatred. I didn't hate God. I was just, was, yes, we did. And this is the problem. We look at people and say, well, they were a Christian, and I want to say, were they, though? Were they? In the church's rush to dunk people in the tank and add numbers to the membership, did we skip over the wrath stuff, the enemy stuff? Two weeks ago, somebody said at my church, I think I'm ready to be baptized. I want to be baptized. I'm like, great. Treat me to lunch, and we'll talk. I didn't say treat me to lunch. All right, so we went out to a nice Greek restaurant. And I said, talk to me about, you know, I'm not going to give you a theological quiz. You don't have to, pa to pass a theology exam to, to get baptized. But talk to me about conversion. What, how did, you know, what happened there? What transpired? I don't even need a singular moment. It was, a, it was, you know, 
this particular day, this particular time, I wrote it down. I mean, it's great if you have that, but, but just talk to me about how, do, how have you come to grips with the fact that you have faith? And he's kind of meandering around it, you know, while I'm eating my, my food. But he's not quite getting to it. And so then I asked point blank, okay, you mentioned Jesus came. What did he come to do? What did he do when he came? Well, he lived and he died on the cross. Okay, why did he die on the cross? Well, because he's loving and John 3.16, God gave. Why did he die? Why didn't he just come and teach? Why didn't he come and just share and do miracles? Why die? Because he took death for me. I should have died. That's almost dropped my fork right there. That's it. Then I dunked him. It's not, it's not just getting the right answer, right? It's helping somebody understand why, what is the predicament out of which God saves us. And it's someone who grapples with the fact that I'm a sinner, I am unrighteous, I am not good, I am actually quite ungodly. I deserve God's wrath because I am God's enemy, actually. Now the rescue is wild. That God loves me enough to take the death for me when I rightly deserve that death? That has staying power. Because when suffering hits your life, you're not like, I didn't sign up for this. You're like, it should be worse, actually. Yeah. My question isn't, why cancer, God? Because my real question is, why the cross, God? And if my real question is, why the cross, I didn't deserve that, then cancer won't rob me of it. See, if we just don't skip what Paul is explaining is at the core of receiving God's love poured into my heart, if I don't see myself as God's enemy, God's love really isn't poured into my heart. It's, it's nice, but it's not love of the caliber that Paul is pointing to here. It's that caliber because of our position before God, and thankfully we're not left in an ungodly state. We're not left as still sinners. We're not left under God's wrath, and we're not left at enmity with God. We're brought into peace with God. And so when we understand that our hope is in a future aspect of salvation, this isn't it. This isn't everything. There's something we're aiming toward that's going to give me staying power in the wilderness. I can aim toward that and recognize that I, I don't even deserve to be on this journey. Then we're plucked out. And what Paul's saying is, if you don't understand that third phase, then you won't endure. But if you don't understand that first phase, what you were actually saved from, the trouble you were actually in, then you won't endure in this middle phase either. But if you understand what you were saved from and you understand what you were saved for, that has staying power, keeping power. Look at the contrast he sets up in verse 9 to drive this home. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? So he's setting up this contrast between where we were, God plucked us out, he justified us, he reconciled us. If he did that, how much more will he finish the job? How much more will he be sure to take us home? If he did it in this situation, then for sure he's going to do it in that situation. And if he does it here and he does it there, that's why I'm being brought along. And then verse 10 emphasizes it again, the same contrast. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life? The contrast there, in one sense, 
is if we were saved while we were enemies, how much more will we be saved while we're at peace with God? If he did it for me when I was in the enemy phase, why wouldn't he complete it when I'm in the friend phase? But to further the contrast, he says, if this was accomplished by Jesus dying, how much more will be accomplished by Jesus living? If Jesus accomplished my salvation by being dead, how much more will he accomplish the end of my salvation by being alive? That is awesome. I think of um, one movie several years ago, and I'll give you spoilers, but that's too bad. You had 20 years to watch it, 22 years to be exact, but the Tom Hanks movie, Castaway, and he's a, uh, an executive, a production analyst who uh, makes sure that FedEx gets their packages to you on time. Some of you like, I already know that's a movie because FedEx, I don't know, sometimes. But he's in charge of making sure that things run on schedule and packages get to where they need to go. That's his job. He hitches a ride with a cargo plane. It goes down with all the packages. Whoever was on board is dead. He's the only survivor on a raft, ends up on an island, and he's under the constant threat of death in that island. He's under the threat of death because he doesn't know how to make a fire. He's under the threat of death because he doesn't know how to crack open a coconut. He's under the threat of death because he's completely isolated. He's under the threat of death because his tooth is decaying. I'll try not to remind you of the details of that scene. It's pretty brutal. But he's, on, he's, on, he's constantly at death's door. And he's surrounded by all these packages that washed up with him. And he opens a bunch of them to try to get stuff to help him survive, except for one package, one package where he says, you know what, I mean, you, this is implied in the movie, he doesn't say it out loud, but he's got one package to say, I'm going to bring this home. This is going to be a part of my hope to know that I'm going to bring this to its final destination. Well, the big spoiler is, he finally gets off the island, he survives, he's rescued, and the movie ends with him taking that package and delivering it, which makes sense. Of course he would deliver it. If he protected that package when he was starving, what if that was a package of beef jerky, right? If he protected that while he was under constant threat of death, how much more will he finish delivering it when he's no longer under the threat of death and he's quite alive and he's in civilization, he's healthy, and Paul's argument here is if Christ accomplished something in the beginning through his death, how much more through his resurrected life is the destination sure? Of course it is. Because this isn't FedEx. This is God working salvation history through people from both Jew and Gentile together in one common tree at the base of which is faith. And we stand in there by grace, he says in verse 2. So why am I still a Christian? I'm still a Christian if I actually am a Christian. I am actually am a Christian if I realize that God's love is one that pours out into an undeserving heart. And if I really reckoned with that, that's what has staying power. The whole gospel, the whole story that begins with the bad news, so then the good news really is good. And the good news doesn't end in phase one. It takes us all the way to the final phase of God's glory. And if we understand that, then our hope will never be robbed by any point of suffering in this life. We hope and long for God's glory later. And we rejoice in the reconciliation that he purchased through Christ's death. And because of that, we now rejoice in any circumstance. Because God always delivers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you give us a sure hope to grab and cling to that is our sure, constant 
We thank you that it is not based on just sheer performance, drumming up our own hope. That would be quite flimsy. We thank you that all of the effort that we put into the Christian life, all of the habits, all of the means by which you apply your grace daily to our lives are founded on something underneath that is your work and that it is accomplished as we live it out Help us to develop a greater taste for glory and this place of rest and promise that you've put ahead. And we thank you for rescue from slavery. We don't want to go back there. Help us to push through this desert as parched as it may be as we look ahead to your glory by your faithfulness. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand as we uh, close in our time together. Jesus. 
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.